So my mother was Karen Brown. She was a sister of four. She grew up in Champaign, Illinois, that's central Illinois. She worked at the University of Illinois in the printing division. She still resides in Urbana, uh, Illinois right now. So my father, Mark Moore, he was uh, one of four siblings, three brothers and a sister, and he grew up in central Illinois as well, and his dad was a farmer, and so he grew up and actually spent time in the military, uh, a couple years in the army over in Germany, and then he went on to the postal service and retired after 35 years of the postal service. And you did not grow up in Illinois where, I mean, you did grow up in Illinois, but you were not born there. Where were you born? Uh, Columbus, Georgia was where I was born. And so it was probably when I was about four years old or five years old that we actually moved to Illinois. Okay. And you have any siblings? Yep. I've got an older sister. She's two years older than me, Melanie. Cool. And she did not serve in the military, correct? No, no. Okay. And uh, although you were born in Georgia, you do not consider that your hometown. What do you consider your hometown? And what was that like when you were growing up? What was it like when you were young in that area? So, so Champaign was a pretty big city compared to where I grew up was Muhammad Seymour. Muhammad Seymour was kind of a suburb. It was just out in the sticks, you know, amongst a cornfield. And it was sprouted a little town amongst other little towns that were kind of separated by soybean fields and cornfields. Uh, growing up, it was pretty simple life. You know, there was, um, you know, just a lot of time playing outside. Uh, early 80s kid, you know, we didn't have computers to, to keep us busy or anything like that. But uh, it was just a lot of neighborhood kids running around when we were younger and, and uh, eventually it was being able to walk to junior high school and walk to high school you know it was a pretty safe neighborhood growing up and uh, there's still a lot of people that I consider some of my good friends that still live there so so what school did you attend when you were growing up there? Muhammad Seymour High School is where I graduated. So I, I did all of my school years pretty much in Muhammad. I remember um, the the middle school and, and the junior high. And it always seemed like the year after I was moving on to the older building or, or the older kids building from junior high to high school, you know, the, the old building I was moving from was getting upgraded like the year after I moved out. So um, so I did all my, my time in, in high school in Illinois in Muhammad Seymour. And then once I graduated, I, I started taking classes at Parkland College, which is uh, a community college in Champaign. So did you do any, uh, did you have any career or any work experience prior to entering military service? Uh, you know, I, I did a lot of uh, like kitchen work and growing up, you know, I worked uh, as a dishwasher and a prep cook and um, I, I worked at a small pizza joint washing dishes for a while and uh, learned the responsibility of, of what money was and, and what it was to work for it. Um, I remember I was a plumber's apprentice for maybe a year or so, a little, little shy of a year. So everything uh, up, up to joining the military was kind of at least teaching me to be punctual and, and learning that there's more responsibilities other than just hanging out out with your buddies. What did your family feel about you joining military? Uh, very supportive. Uh, my, my grandfather was a World War II vet and my stepfather uh, that I was living with, he was a uh, in the Navy for quite some time, so he was very proud of his service. So uh, they were all very supportive of, of not only the fact that I was entering the military, but I was at least doing something other than just wavering from kind of nonchalant jobs and, and just kind of hanging out, wasting time. So they were very um, grateful that uh, I went through with it. And I knew it was something that I couldn't just like opt out of once I signed the paperwork. It's like you, you join up and that's it, they're all there is to it. So they were very happy to see. Me go. What about your friends? Did they have the same feeling when you decided that you were going to enlist? Yeah, you know, there wasn't really a shock therapy there. there. I didn't have to like talk about it to a bunch of them or, or none of them tried to talk me out of it once they figured out that's what I was going to decide to do. They were all pretty supportive as well and, and um, they were probably uh, happy to see me go into the military but not necessarily happy to see me go. <laughs> gotcha. So tell me about your decision to join what influenced that process well uh, um again i was a young punk kid that was basically just working from from small job to small job and not really saving any money and you know i i pretty much uh 
exhumed, uh, exhumed all my time through Parkland as far as withdrawing from classes. I found out that skipping class was cool and fun until you're, you know, not getting the grades. So I wasn't even going to Parkland College anymore and, and um, just hanging out during the day and, and, you know, staying up all night, just hanging out with people. And so there was really nothing that was going for me. And I knew that uh, that would at least get me to travel. And, and uh, I know my grandpa was really proud of his service as well. So. Why did you end up choosing the army? Well, um, I, there was a, a certain list of things that we were going to be able to do that was a prerequisite to entering that would be able to up your pay grade, maybe one or two grades entering. So um, there was a, a physical fitness test or there was um, somebody that was going to join with you or you took a certain aptitude test to, to, to get a certain pay grade. And I know that that was something that would be a jump start to it, but it was the uh, the artillery videos at the recruiting station, you know, and, and I didn't, I knew there was so many jobs to choose from, but realistically, I, I didn't want um, any particular desk job. I wanted, I wanted something with some excitement. And he showed me a video of these cannons just blasting away and explosions on the horizon. And I was all about it, most definitely. I just didn't know what it entailed as far as duty stations, and, and I just knew that that was the job I wanted to do. Cool. Walk me through that first day you arrive at training. So you arrive at training, what's going through your head? What are your thoughts? What was the setting like? Well, it, it was, it was 2002. It was, um, an all male basic training and it was in an all male unit. We were in a combat MOS and, and it was still basic training, um, to start with, but, uh, it was definitely a shock factor. Um, it was definitely something that I was just trying to blend in. I didn't want to stand out to be the best or be the slowest. Um, but I knew that ultimately the easiest way to get through it was just to fall in where you were supposed to and then try to do things as quick as possible. But they caught on real quick after the first day of knowing that you didn't do anything unless they told you, which was pretty easy. Don't do nothing unless they tell you to. <laughs> what, what is your most vivid memory of training? Oh, the it's, you know, it's waking up every morning. It's waking up every morning and the lights don't just click on and, and you just kind of yawn and stretch. It's people walking in slamming garbage can lids and yelling and, and telling you to get up and you only got so many minutes or else. And you don't know what the or else is. They're just telling you, you got two minutes to shave or two minutes to brush your teeth. You better get it done. And so, and so it was always the, the up and at like shock factor of waking up, you know, sleep was so precious, but, but when you woke up, you were up. I mean, you had, there was no yawning and stretching about it. Uh, what did you think was the, the hardest part of training? Uh, it, it, I think the hardest part of training was, was, was not excelling and and blend and actually blending in. You know, one thing my dad, you know, suggested to me before I left, he said, you know, just just blend in. Don't don't be the first and don't be the last. Don't get chewed out for this and don't have them expect you to be the best all the time if you shine in certain things. So um maybe maybe holding back in certain things, um, whether it be physical fitness or whether it be, you know, riflemen or, or whether it be, you know, reading a map or this or that, or leading, you know, it, leadership didn't really come naturally to me. I, I was very grateful that there was a lot of really good leaders that I had to look up to before I entered that, that position eventually. Did you find it challenging adapting to the militarization throughout training? Yeah. Um, it, it, it had to fall in place one thing at a time. So, um, despite there being something that we're training differently every day, you know, drill and ceremony or, or shooting or this or that, or gas chamber, you know, there's all these different things going on. Um, structure was something that, that came over time and routine was something that came over time and adaptation was something that, that had to come over time. So once those things fell into place after maybe seven weeks or eight weeks of the culmination of a nine week basic training, it was pretty comfortable to know that everything was routine and that it was going to be laid out for you and told directly to you. There's not going to be any things that would fall between the cracks and the instructions at all. Do you recall any particular instructors you had? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember a drill instructor, um, 
hair. Uh, yeah, the you know one was a marine prior to this, and so he was just stacked from head to toe. I mean, he had just a huge chest and huge arms and everything, and and big huge guy. And and we were just proud of the fact that you know with him we could run probably eight, ten, twelve miles and not stop, and he didn't want to stop. And and um, but then there were some of them that were were short and loud, and some of them that that were relaxed until you know all of them started getting on with each other. But but um, they all they all were were proud to be where they were. I know that. Did any of them stand out in a way that you still remember and take, like, you remember their advice or any of the things that they specifically said that might relate to anything you do now? Or, like, looking back, you're like, man, that. I remember my instructor saying this. You know, it, it, not not really, because the thing was, this was six months after 9-11. So they were really amped up about the fact that, that people were going off to war or getting ready to go off to war. You know, and I wasn't in an infantry unit. I wasn't in a special operations unit or, you know, a, a ranger battalion or anything to where some of these people after the Marines go in initially. But, but it was two years of, of serving and training at Fort Hood uh, before we actually deployed. But... It, but all the drill sergeants were really saying, I remember, it's just, you know, stay, come back alive. They said, you know, you're, you're in a combat job, so you're going to be going eventually. So just come back alive. That's all they kept saying. Yeah. How did you, what was your feelings when you were finally complete? Like you're going to graduation of your training. What's running through your head as, you know, you're, you're like, oh, finally completed it. It's done not going to be screamed out every day Co completely oblivious to what was coming up next <laughs> uh realistically um you know they, they amp you up through all this training to come to find out when you get to your regular duty station sometimes it's a five to five job everybody's like well you know it's a nine to five job maybe well it was like a five to five job getting up and doing you know physical training in the morning and there's different formations and motor pool work you know it gets you know like like a routine every day you know but but we're always training about something we're always doing something some sort of training and then come the field exercises so i was completely oblivious to all of that you know when i came out of basic training and, and the advanced individual training so we were one station you unit training in uh, Fort uh, Sill, Oklahoma. So that's the artillery station. So instead of doing basic training and then shipping off to an AIT, advanced individual training to do something somewhere else, you know, for your particular job or MOS, we stayed in the exact same place. So once we got through basic training and started doing our howitzer training week by week, it was more laxed by then. The drill instructors were barely even present. You know, they knew that we could do things on our own. But um, but I was when I got to Fort Hood, I was completely oblivious. I went to a Fourth of July parade right after basic training, and I was riding in the back of a pickup truck with my grandpa. You know, we were in the parade, and I was wearing my green fatigues, and I you know didn't have a unit patch on yet, and just out of basic training. But some um, some uh, National Guard sergeant that was in his fatigues came up, and I snapped a parade rest, you know, as if I was in basic training again, you know, and he's just like, oh, oh you know, we're this is no problem. But but um, I, it was completely, I was oblivious. I was brand new to it all. So you mentioned the advanced training after the basic. What uh, was it like? Any specialization that you did? Yeah, so 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 when we're when we're doing howitzer training, the three different pieces of equipment that we're working with, um, one of them was was small enough, like a light artillery, where they would fly them in with helicopters. You know, like if it was in Afghanistan or something, they would just drop them on the side of a mountain and they'd have artillery support. So another one was bigger that shot 155 millimeters, you know, 100 pound bullets, but they were towed, so they'd break down on two wheels. And so I was in a self propelled howitzer, and it was, um, you know, a computerized system that shot you all the information from the fire direction center and it was a crew of, of I think five guys or, or maybe four guys but there was a, an, a, an ammo carrier that came along with the howitzers so every time we went to the field at Fort Hood the howitzer training we've been out there for maybe two weeks or something like that and everybody in the cities that lived around the base could hear us firing off howitzers over the weekend throughout the night everything like that boom boom so that was that was something that we really were, were excited about we were, we were waking everybody up when we were in the field. Philip, what was your first assignment after training? Well, this is that's an interesting question because in almost eight years of my service, I was 
always in the same unit. I was in the 2nd Battalion of the 82nd Field Artillery and the 3rd Brigade Combat Team, Gray Wolf, in the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood, Texas. So when we were in basic training, we were getting ready to you know, graduate everything. They said, well, pick out three duty stations that you would like. Well, everybody wants Hawaii. Yeah, there's an artillery base. There's artillery unit in Hawaii. This and, you know, very little, but, but I definitely wanted somewhere that wasn't cold. Yeah, because they have artillery unit in New York, you know, Fort Drum to where you're, you're freezing and you're up in the mountains and everything. But, but so Texas was another choice and, and I was able to get that. And uh, I was really excited about at least going somewhere that I've never been. And it was a really big state with a lot of history and a lot of different cities, you know, to travel to and see while I'm there. And uh, it was warmer, a lot warmer than Illinois. So in that field artillery unit, I went through three different batteries. So I didn't really know this at the time. So, you know, you think of army, you know, and you, you hear people, company, attention. A company is a group of maybe a hundred people. Yeah, so the average common element in the army is a, a company, whether you're cooks, whether you're this or that, whatever, it's a company. But if you're artillery, you are a battery, you are a firing battery. Yeah. So like if you were a bunch of helicopters, you're a squadron, you know? So I learned that I'm a, a, of this battery. So, so there's three firing batteries, meaning there's, there's so many guns per, per hundred people. And then there's support elements. That's, um, a, petroleum based stuff and and so this was a service battery so part of a service battery was the ammunition to go along with these howitzers and these ammunitions were palletized and big stacks of canisters that had the propellant bags inside and so for the first two years of my service in a howitzer unit that I shot these big cannons in in basic training and was ready to shoot these big guns I was in an ammo platoon <laughs> training on these ammo trucks with these big flat racks that came down to the ground and big Big cranes that hoisted the pallets around off to the and that's what we would do in the field while the howitzers were shooting we're driving from place to place distributing the ammunition and when they're done we would pick up what was called the dunnage all the old empty powder cans and all the wooden crates that the rounds came on and everything like that so it wasn't actually until my first deployment to to Iraq that I was plucked out of my service battery platoon that I trained with for two years and went with a firing battery that was detached from the rest of the group of the rest of the battalion and attached to a completely different battalion, one to one field artillery, which was a rocket artillery. So we were kind of the stepsisters in that particular, uh, the redheaded stepchild of that deployment. But, but um, to be training for, you know, so long with a group of people to be plucked from them and, and put with a bunch of group of folks, it was, you know, kind of terrifying to, trust my life with a bunch of people I didn't really know. And I got to know them over the time of being there. So how many deployments did you end up doing? I, so I did three deployments. Um, the first one was 2004 to 2005. It was basically right after Saddam was captured. So, you know, you thought, well, you know, the bad guys captured, everything's fine and dandy. Well, they were really in an uproar because they didn't want us there. They said, well, you know, he's captured. What are you still doing here? You know, we don't want you here. Everything's in an uproar and, and you're, you're drawing these insurgents in because of just the fact that, you know, America is here as a presence. And, and so it was a really tough time to be over there in a place that, that I didn't know the culture too well, but, but they didn't want us to be there and they didn't like us. And, um, but that was Baghdad and I saw the first set of elections. It was a lot of suicide bombs, you know, it was a lot of car bombs, um, you know, IEDs, roadside bombs were not really a big thing back then. It was still a lot of urban city kind of warfare. Um, we drove our ammo trucks full of howitzer ammunition from Kuwait to Baghdad. We were the last group of, of deployments to really do that instead of just flying in. So it took three days to go from Kuwait to Baghdad and I was nervous the entire time um, driving this big huge ammo truck with hundreds and hundreds of rounds that would just go up you know for anything but we were going in soft skin Humvees with tripods and 50 cows pointing out the back you know so it wasn't until we actually got there that the standard Humvee say on post for a military police unit on an army base, you know, they can have the, the hatch pop up in the middle of the cab and have somebody stick out the top and, you know, put a rifle or something. 
we, we didn't have that. You so know? What was the, what was the mission that you were assigned to during that first deployment? Like what was your goal when it, you were there? It was the immediate security of, um, pretty much point from point A to the green zone. So, um, the battalion that I was with, uh, we were responsible for the immediate security of the, the forward operating base that we were on um, within maybe 15 miles around it. So all the indirect fire that was coming over the walls, um, all of the ambushes that are down the road at the overpass, um, people that were s illegally uh, buying up gas and then selling it and, and putting pe other people out of business or you know certain things that we had to be responsible for that were immediately around our FOB. Um, a lot of people that served in, in Iraq back in the early days, they know of Route Irish. You know, Route Irish, Route Irish was one of the really big arteries that uh, supplied uh, insurgents, not only transportation, but supplies back and forth to start making IEDs and ambushes and things. And so what we would do sometimes twice a day was called the Irish sweep, where we would just drive 20, 30 miles back and forth on Rod Irish, almost pro provoking people to, to say, hey, where's the bad guys? We're out here, come get us. <laughs> Crazy. So I had a, when do you complete your first deployment, where do you go from there? Uh, back to Fort Hood. And so um, little did I know that, that after one deployment, you're part of a group that's going to come home, train again, and go right back. It's just a series of rotations. You know, it's just a rotation. I'm on my third rotation. Well, some people say, how many deployments or how many trips? Or they start being rotations because it's just a big circle. You're just going back and back. And so going back to Fort Hood, um, you know, they say you have a year, you know, between deployments. But realistically, you're, you're in the field every so often. Probably every six months, you go to the field at least three times. Um, you're training every day, sometimes late. You're going to the range sometimes late doing night fire exercises and then uh, Right before you deploy you go to a training center So it'd be whether it's a national training center in California or the joint readiness training center in Louisiana You know, it just depends on where you're going to be deploying um, Before I even went to Baghdad the first time we deployed to Montana to uh, fight forest fires. And so we had no idea what we're doing, but we had all the fire retardant outfits. They gave two soldiers a tent. You had 250 tents, dress right dress and lines, you know, with our bags inside. And it was on a, a private landowner that, that supplied all the land for everybody to stay on to fight these fires. But we would take a bus for two hours and get out and hike up a mountain. And some guys had chainsaws. Some guys had big gas cans, you know, for the chainsaw, things like that. So that was my very first deployment to say really, wow, we could, I guess, go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting outlook on it, too, because now you've deployed to the Middle East, but then you also deploy to somewhere in the United States and see, like, the parallels of what it's like. And the oh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, what was the exact same, probably, was the dining facilities. Okay, so even in Kuwait, and, and the dining facilities were always top notch because of the fact that that was maybe one of the, the morale boosters that we could control. You know, we couldn't control how long we were outside the wire. We couldn't control, you know, coming close to running out of ammo or not having enough supplies if we were out for so long. You know, but we could definitely control how much food we were gonna pound down our gullets to be able to keep going and how, how great it was to have that available. Um, but, uh, but Montana was, was, you know, it was neat because it was our first taste of being away from our families for so many weeks at a time. But, but, uh, the second deployment was, was really long because that was during the big troop surge, you know, when, when there was 20,000 plus troops that were sent over there during this. And so six months into my second deployment, we learned that, that it was going to be closer to maybe 15 or 18 months that we were going to be over there. So what did what was your mission on the second deployment when you, when you got there? Pretty much, pretty much same thing. The immediate security of the logistical staging area where we were at. Now we always brought our howitzers when we were over there. Okay, so we weren't just you know providing howitzer support from the base we were on. We were given vehicles, and they said, "This is your area of operations. This is you know start learning it. These are your Humvees or whatever." But we also always had a very small crew that was already delegated to go with the howitzers wherever they 
they're going to go in place and set up to be fire support. So even though uh, they weren't necessarily firing all the time, they were always still ready. The majority of us were in maneuver platoons. We were doing, um, you know, IED sweeps on the roads. We were doing ambushes at night. We were doing um, surveillance at night. We were doing a lot of counterintelligence. We were doing a lot of what's called mosque collection. So we would actually stash out on a rooftop and, and record a mosque session and have our interpreter decipher it to make sure that they weren't putting messages out into the neighborhood about anything. So it was a lot of GI Joe stuff. The second deployment was a lot of fun uh, because we had a lot of air support. We were actually on a big logistical staging area. So instead of a small fob, this was a place where we had the Air Force as well. We had F-16s taken off every 10 minutes. We had Apache support sometimes on our missions that would go sweep the, the route for us. But we also had something called route clearance. Now route clearance was something that would go ahead and send radar signals into the ground for IEDs because where we were is very rural. There was a lot of canals and most of the roads were dirt roads. So it was very easy for somebody to bury, bury bombs. And we, that's where we saw probably a lot of the most IEDs was, was in Balad, it was where my second deployment was. So despite the air support, that's not doing us any good when we go out in a Humvee and, and you know, it's, and a lot of it was, was adaptive to us. So they started planting IEDs on the opposite side of the road of the canal. So the, the force of the IED would flip the Humvee over and it would land upside down in the canal and people were drowning that way. So after this happening only so long, they were putting individual air canisters, you know, like attached at the doors for every passenger and gunner in the Humvees then. Was that a big difference between the first deployment? You said there weren't a lot of IEDs in that first deployment. Yeah. That was like a new method, not a new method, but a change in method. It, it was wow. it was a little more terrifying than, than possibly getting picked off by a sniper in the middle of the city of Baghdad, you know, or, or a firefight or, or a street getting shut down by an explosion to where now you're kind of pinned, you know, with only so many ways out in, in the city. Um, being out in, in the country, you know, you, you almost, we weren't um, complacent to it, but every little bump in the road was was just, you know, it's just kind of nerve wracking because uh, because out there a lot of times it was an old hole that was utilized by somebody else to, to put a new bomb in the road um, and it was very it was real vast it was very vast and so sometimes when we would go and m make our peace with whoever we had to talk to if we had to go to a city official you know or go talk to somebody in a town about projects that were coming up you know we never just went out to go look for a fight during that second deployment it was a lot about winning hearts and minds by then you know and and, um, and so we did a lot of face-to-face of -face with people, but sometimes they would tell us, well, despite the mission being over, um, you got to wait for route clearance to come by. We, we just, we, you know, the cameras that are on base haven't been able to watch everything everywhere at all times while you've been gone. So somebody might have put something in the in the road on the route back. So you gotta wait for route clearance. And as we're waiting, cause they go so so slow to be able to read the ground, mortars might be dropping in around us where people have been watching our position. And now they're starting to bring in an ambush or something with mortars that are, and we, and we say, you know what? We don't, we're not listening to you guys sitting at a desk right now. Mortars are getting closer. We're not waiting for route clearance. We'll take our chances, <laughs> you know, back to the base. Did you notice a change? So. When you mentioned on your first deployment, the Iraqis didn't want you there. And it seemed like there was like yeah. a lot of backlash about U.S. troops being there. Was there a yeah. change on that second deployment with the civilian population? There was because by then there, there were so many city projects that at least had sprung up. Um, I remember on my first deployment, I mean, there were Iraqis that were getting paid cash weekly to just come on post after getting searched and everything to just pick up all the garbage blown around. So, so by 2007, 2006, you know, into this thing already, there was already school projects and hospital projects and soccer fields being built and, you know, the city water buildings trying to be facilitated to people that didn't have these means by then. So they knew that, that our presence wasn't necessarily provoking a bunch of insurgents to come about. It was being the security to be there to put all these things into their neighborhood. Um, and, and there were a lot of nights to where we would be there for maybe 20 hours and pull a night surveillance and they would come out with a big tray of hot tea, fresh cut oranges to make sure that we were at least okay and, and well enough to, to keep continuing to stay awake. They knew we were out there, but maybe the enemy didn't, you know. 
so there was a lot of really great, great moments like that over there. So as you transition from the end of the second one, you, do you go back to back to Fort hood? Yeah. Now at, before I went back from my second deployment, it was, this is a really big um, deal because by then I went to the promotion board while I was in Iraq to be a Sergeant. Okay. So, so my second deployment, I was a, a seasoned specialist. It was my second deployment. You know, I was, I was helping the younger privates for their first deployment, you know, figure it out and, and certain things. And so by then I was already taking on this leadership role and um, I developed this relationship with this one particular guy who was the gunner in the Humvee that I was driving. And so, you know, day in and day out at the beginning and every and end of every mission, it was just him and I, he was my roommate. And, and um, you know, the second deployment, at the end of it, he ended up getting blown up and I had to carry him to a, a helicopter in the middle of the night. And, and so he could have got out on a medical disability, but he decided when he found out that our unit was going again, he reenlisted to, to go again. So I wouldn't have to go without him. Um, so that was the second deployment. Now, once we went back, um, Everybody went on Christmas leave. You know, we we spent two two Thanksgivings in Iraq. It was time to come home for that second deployment. And so, uh, I called up my chain of command when I was home from Christmas, and they said, "Look, you went to promotion board. You you got this. Yeah, just just put it on. Just put the rank on. You know, you got. We're not going to do some big promotion ceremony. You know, you come back, and we're just going to go to go to business. And so that's what I did. And I spent a whole year as a leadership role, and I took on certain roles as a. a um, uh, E5 and when it came to the staff sergeants and the platoon sergeants needing things done, they knew that they could, you know, delegate to me to where they could take off and not have to worry about it. And, um, I, I earned the, uh, the title of crime prevention NCO that I was responsible for all of the high value items in the barracks for all the soldiers and, um, it kept tabs on everything as far as everybody's, uh, um, belongings in the barracks. And, um, so it, it was a big deal being a Sergeant for me. And then once we started to get ready to go again to Iraq for the third time, uh, then it got really, really real. Uh, cause I knew that it was other lives, definitely dependent on me. You know, I mean, as a soldier, you might forget to bring the extra water or forget this and get yelled at. Uh, but as a, a leader of soldiers, um, you don't get to have the luxury of, oops, I made a mistake because it's definitely their lives in your hands. Yeah, definitely understand that. So you, once you became a Sergeant, you're now in that leadership position where you said you weren't necessarily comfortable during training think you now are seasoned at that moment and you're more comfortable with your position. And Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's one thing they teach you, especially when I was going into the board, you know, I was a nervous wreck. I was facing four first sergeants and a command sergeant major. And, um, you know, they said, if, if you don't know something, that's okay, but be confident about it. Be confident about it because it's, it's once a soldier sees a leader show that kind of, um, inferiority to them, you know, or, or a lack of competence, then they're not going to have that, that respect and confidence in that leader. So I knew I had to be the best of it. So as an E4, even before I even got promoted, they, they sent me to primary leadership development course. And, uh, as an E4, I, ho I held the position of a platoon leader over 30 soldiers that I didn't know. It was all co-ed from different units intermingled and everything. But, but during that whole course, I held the, the, the position of platoon leader when realistically they want to swap it out to different people so that everybody can get different feelings for the leadership role. But I, they asked everybody in the platoon if they wanted to swap out and they're like, no, no, he's doing just fine. You know, let him, let him be there because it would, it would really be, you know, the, the, the cadre and the instructors telling us what they wanted us to do. And then I would, they would leave and I'd say, okay, smoke him if you got him. And then we got to get to it. You know, it was real. It wasn't like I'm in a leadership role and I'm going to bust your chops because I can. So, so being, you know, taking that in, I, I learned from a lot of really good leaders. And when I got plucked from my service battery and attached to this firing battery before my first deployment, there was a first sergeant that came in, Brian Lindsay. I'll never forget him. He was a first sergeant. He worked his way up all the way to the command sergeant major of the training facility at Fort Sill for artillery. He was just that good. But he came in the first day as the first sergeant and everybody in the barracks, they had to empty out all their stuff and they called what was called a GI party to where every square inch of every barracks room and then bathrooms and showers, everything got cleaned. Every, every little square inch of it was clean. And his first day, and he said, this is the standard from now on while I'm ahead of the place here, you know? And so everybody respected that. So I was really grateful uh, to have leadership leadership to learn from. And that that's really what, what 
put a lot into me being a good leader as well. Yeah. So now you're you're in a sergeant and you're getting ready for your third deployment. What is the mission? And then walk me through that third deployment. So it was funny. So every time our brigade commander, we get back from a deployment, you know, he said, oh, they said that we couldn't do it. You know, an artillery unit took up infantry and did this and that. So it was the same mission at hand. Our third deployment, you know, uh, was the immediate security of our logistical staging area. Mm -hmm. So it was in Mosul, Iraq. So it was back to the city and Mosul was, I mean, it was busy. It was really, really busy. We got to, to cross the Euphrates, Tigris River every single day. Saw some really big grand mosques, saw some really ancient stuff, you know, and um, it, it was, it was nice to be back in the city. It was a lot more to see, you know, this and that. But um, we were doing just maneuvers through the day, maybe four or five hours a day, just kind of being out, you know, in the public view. And it's, it's just called a command presence, you know. Well, we don't really have particular people we have to go meet or talk with, you know, or bad guys to go look for, per se, right now. We're just going to go make a command presence and hope that everything goes okay. <laughs> and, of course, you know, sometimes it doesn't. But you know, being, being a leadership, it was, it was great. I had a lot of great leaders in my platoon that was helping me out that were um, in a leadership role longer than I had been. And, um, but, but I went on leave for two weeks to come home six months into it. And when I came back, everything was different. So what happened was they said, well, the city of Mosul does not want us maneuvering through their city. We have these big giant vehicles now, you know, with, you know, giant antennas that pull down their, their wires and this and that. But, but they said, they're not going to allow us to operate in the city anymore. So what we did was we developed an outpost within the city right underneath their nose a very minimal security, one maneuver platoon to actually make security of the place. Yeah. And then you had two other maneuver platoons that were pulling maneuver uh, um, operations for 24 hours. And so at the 24th hour, that's when it would be midnight, one o'clock. That's when everybody would switch. And, you know, so one platoon would be covering the base and the outpost, two other platoons would be out for 24 hours. And then the fourth maneuver platoon was out on the big base, what we call refit, where it's just like, you got a week to clean your weapon, you know, get hot food at the dining facility, use the phones, use the internet, you know, go to the gym, whatever. And then after that week, you're back out of that outpost yeah. where you got hot chow out of, you know, this thing right here. And, and you got um, two big black tanks of water. And if you run out of water, you run out of water, you know, as far as showering goes and things like that. It was pretty rough. Um, you think the, the longer time that's spent over there, the, the nicer facilities you might have. And it, it, not really. <laughs> so after that third deployment, do you go back? to the same location or is that you're done after that? I've, I've pushed the envelope too far. Um, you know, there were, there were particular missions that we were sitting on IEDs um, and we had the area corned on and off and this and that, you know, you know, this we're waiting for people and somebody would show up and say, Hey, you know, um, We'll, we'll take over for you and say, yeah, okay, I appreciate it. And as soon as we leave, right where we were sitting, boom, you know, the, and we were sitting on it for two hours. I, I was tired of pushing that. I was tired of pushing that luck. Uh, there were, I, I knew mechanics that were killed laying underneath the Humvee working on it, just doing their job on the base. And then some rocket comes flying in and, and blows them up. So I, I was done with that. I got back from, from doing two weeks at home in, in the States, my first deployment. And I came back to my room and there was glass all over my bunk and there was plywood over my window. And I was like, well, what was doing? They said, go outside and look. And there was a Humvee that was all crippled and there was just shrapnel all over the wall. And so a rocket came in to our base and blew up right outside the barracks. We were staying. So I was done with that after three times of that. You know, it's, it's honorable and it's who a GI Joe stuff, but I knew that it was just a matter of time at that point. Some bad would happen. So I'm really glad to have my fingers and toes. <laughs> there, uh, there were days that we wouldn't, we wouldn't see a thing. There'd be weeks that we wouldn't see a thing. Um, but, but when things happened, it was, I mean, it was significant. It was, it, it, it lasted with us. And then when they say, well, you know, these people tried to kill you there yesterday and you're going there tomorrow. So good luck, <laughs> you know, get on with it. Um, th that just that idea of that, um, for so long, just day in and day out, regardless of how many firefights or how many bullets or, you know, oh my gosh, there's the brass is piling up or, you know, it's, 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 it's not like that. You know, we, we never went days to say, well, you know, I've gone so long without firing my weapon. I just can't stand. 
you know, it, it, you, you hope that you're bored when you're outside the wire. So I was in a unit that we were outside the wire every single day every single day. Now, sometimes they say, well, you know, we've got so many people in the vehicles, you know, one person can stay back or, you know, like a squad would rotate people to stay back, you know, and hang out. And that was, that was some of the greatest times. But, but at the same time, knowing that, that your buddies are out there on a patrol that's supposed to be so long and now it's two or three or four hours after they're supposed to be back, you know, knowing that you could have been out there with them those days off. So we'll, we'll transition from oh like away from that negative experience and um, kind of switch gears and talk about some of the more positive things that occurred like during those deployments in your time in service yeah so you what kind of friendships did you form and like who who were they and do you still keep in touch with them well, um, I, I had mentioned that the guy that um, I palled with my second deployment, he was the gunner and I was the driver in the Humvee. So we were both palling it up, our th his second deployment, my third deployment. He lives out in, um, I think I want to say California maybe, but I don't ever talk to him, but some of the greatest people in the world, you know, and, and I think uh, one of the biggest shames of getting out of the service is, is not discontinuing one of the greatest things you've ever done or, you know, whatever camaraderie. It's the fact that you can't pick up and just go see the person, you know, whenever you want. Everybody has lives afterwards, you know, but um, I, I've met people for, from Tonga, I met people from Micronesia, you know, and we, we always would make fun of each other's accents if we were from different parts of the country, <laughs> yeah. Um, so there was a, a huge conglomerate of people, but what I was really lucky uh, about where I served and who I served with was the fact that it was an all male unit. Um, and and it, it's, I'm not trying to um, be uh, offensive or sexist at all, but, but the fact of the matter was, um, we weren't shy about being guys. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, we didn't have to expose that to a bunch of females to, to, uh, to offend them. Because I know nowadays there's a lot of things going on as far as the military is concerned. And, and places are getting a bad rap and, and, you know, Fort Hood possibly getting renamed and this and that. You know, but, but um, uh, we had, I think we had a couple of females with us when, when we had to search females for this and that but greatest people in the world and, and um i do keep in touch with probably a handful of them as a matter of fact you know one of the greater times over there was celebrating my birthday because i was serving with another guy little little black guy like five feet tall you know that we're twins though yeah because we're born on the same date and he's one year older but he was in my unit in my platoon as well and we went on patrols together you know and so every year that we were over there we would go out to like an iraqi bazaar and get each other a birthday present you know so um so the people that I do keep in contact with, they are very special and I don't even have a, a Facebook page. I'm not on social media. Um, I do wish that there were probably a certain amount of people that I could get a hold of somehow, some way. Um, but, but realistically, um, I'm very grateful to keep in contact with the ones that I do because I think according to, to the handful that I do talk to, I'm the only one that they talk to. Um, so I'm very grateful that, that there's even a few that, that keep in contact and there's, no, there's been no reunions. I mean, that, that's probably going to be a, a really hard thing to do for so many people that have lives, you know, going on or kids or, or, you know, in college or jobs or this or that, you know, maybe one day. Um, but I've traveled to see a couple of people. I, I went to Oklahoma as soon as I got out and saw a buddy I served with and I drove, uh, up to Virginia and, and saw another buddy. And so, uh, so yeah, there, there's still folks that I definitely talk to. Cool. When you were during your deployments or during training, was there anything that you did recreationally for fun um, when you weren't on duty or just you guys off time? Like even if it was in Iraq or during training or? Um, well, you know, it, it, being in Fort Hood, uh, Texas, there was a lot of like country themed bars and dance bars, you know, so uh, uh, the first initial years of being in, I thought it was pretty neat to, to go and, and two step and, and go out to the country bars and, and drink with the buddies and catch a cab back to the barracks, you know, and, and, and have that kind of lifestyle. Um, but really when I was, um, when I was off duty, uh, 
it, it was it was just really thinking about things that were coming up as far as training goes. I mean, you know, if something's coming up in two weeks and it involves this amount of X gear, I want to be able to have all my gear accounted for to where it's clean and, and operable and everything like that. So a lot of my downtime w was truly just prepping for stuff that was coming up as far as field training exercises or inspections or. Yeah, I, I understand that. I definitely experienced very similar. I like, you know, you go to bed and you wake up and you're like, oh, I gotta do this next. Yeah, and that well, that and that's all you think of when you're going to bed. I I learned that the that the people that do the um, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier they spend eight hours preparing their uniform. Eight hours, that's a full shift of work, yeah. getting your uniform together, and now you gotta go stand for so long. So so I remember when I was in that primary leadership course, I was telling people that outranked me what to do every day, you know, but, but I was the last one to go to sleep because I was up shining my boots and ironing my uniform. And I said, nobody that's gonna stand behind me is gonna look better than me. I, if I'm gonna be out front, I'm gonna have the shiniest boots and- Set the standard. Uh, yeah, exactly, that's, have, and that's what you have to do from, exactly, from the front, lead from the front, exactly. Uh, how do you stay in touch with your family or friends back in the United States when you were deployed uh, during those times? Uh, um, calling cards. So calling cards were a big thing back then. So we always had some sort of call center to where there were so many telephones, you know, and, and there were places, especially in Kuwait, like MWR, which stood for uh, morale, welfare, and recreation, you know, and they had certain things like that. Um, computers were spotty. I mean, even from, from 2004 to 2009, um, computer labs were here and there. They were, they were few and far between. I remember specifically being quite frustrated with having and four computers on that little outpost in Mosul that we made, and we had four computers for soldiers for downtime or whatever, and people were sitting on there playing Farmville. Um, <laughs> and, if, and, and literally though, now in recollection, if that's what took their mind off it for whatever time they were on there, hallelujah, you know. I wanna pay my bills in the States and, and tell my family I'm okay, um, but, but if people are getting at least a little bit of peace of mind from where they were out there planting digital crops, then, then hallelujah, <laughs> you know, it's funny. <laughs> Were there any particular humorous or unusual events that occurred when you were in training or when you were in service? And if there were, are you able to share any of those stories? Yeah, um, I remember sitting on an observation post in Baghdad and it was on top of a bombed out building and it was probably two in the morning and there was three or four of us that were dropped off by Humvees, you know, right before sunset. And usually that's what would happen if we were gonna dismount, the Humvees would let us go before sunset, you know, and we'd be in our place by dark, you know. And so we're just watching for people on Route Irish, watching, you know, to see who, if anybody's gonna be driving around past these curfews they had or whatever, you know, we're sitting up there and it's my Self and, and private, uh, a sergeant, and our captain. And so being out on patrol with a captain is a big deal because usually we got a platoon sergeant, you know, maybe even once in a while a first sergeant. So it's just myself and this sergeant and a captain. So I, I really got to be on my P's and Q's. So I've got the radio with me and we're just kind of sitting and observing. And so this convoy of tanks, Abrams tanks, comes out of nowhere, at, you know, early in the morning. And right when they get in front of the building that we're sitting in, the middle one stops and the turret starts turning to us. And so my captain's like, you hear any chatter on the radio about Lou Lou coming through? I said, sir, I said, no, sir, you know, I mean, it's been quiet. I'll call Battalion Maine and see, you know, whatever. He was like, oh, stand by. And so the, the tube starts elevating <laughs> the tube on, on the tank. And so he said, get on that radar. <laughs> so I'm in the dark and, and so we can't just like flash them and be like, hey, we're good guys up here. Cause if any other bad guys are there watching, now they know where we're at. Okay, so so in about 30 seconds of spitting all sorts of just nonsense through the, through the radio, we pretty much identified that we were up there. We got with their battalion headquarters and everything and we crossed traffic to where we're actually on the same frequency at one point. And so finally the tube depresses, you know, and the turret straightens back out and they take off. And um, that was probably some of the most terrifying 30 seconds of uh, you better perform or else. <laughs> it wasn't some heated firefight, you know, it's where I thought I was gonna get shot or anything like that. I mean, this was a tank that was almost pointing at us. That's scary. <laughs> was there anything that you did for good luck 
or like any rituals that you or your buddies followed when you were there? Just like, uh, I don't know, you go to deployment, you're going to do this before we go as like a good luck charm or carry something that meant something to you. Uh, you know, I, I think I knew people that, that had done that. Uh, myself, personally, there was nothing particular that I did. I mean, everything was kind of different, but um, I was just always amped up and jacked up whenever we would hit the, um, you know, the gate to go out and... Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was always something different, but never I never really developed any any special habit or anything like that before I went. Cool. What would you say your best part of your service experience was? Uh, probably being being in a combat brigade. Um, I, and this is the thing: when we were over there, okay, um, we were nicknaming the people that never left. Fobbits. There was an actual infantry unit that, that made a rap song about Fobbits, you know, oh, I'm checking IDs at the at the gym and this and that. That's BS, okay? Whether you got drafted, whether you raised your right hand, whether you're in petroleum, whether you're a paper pusher, whether you are, are slinging chow, or whether you're slinging bullets or anything like that, everybody is important that serves. Every single person is, that, that serves is an integral part of, of a bigger team of that. So I've learned that since, since you know, a couple of, uh, of deployments past that first one um, th that everybody has a, a huge part to play and uh, I can respect anybody that has honorably seen it through to the days that they signed up for especially people that were in during those those times of uh, being stop lost you know that they, and there's a movie called stop loss you you know well despite what you signed up for you're going again <laughs> you know what I mean what are you talking about <laughs> no I get I, I definitely understand that and I think that's Another thing that the Library of Congress is really trying to push too is, like you said, no matter what your role was, everyone's story is important. Yeah, and absolutely. Absolutely. means something. Absolutely. What is your, or what are your proudest moments of your career, or what are you most proud of from your, throughout your career? Uh, I'm proud that I was able to um, re-enlist after having gone through um, a deployment and a half, knowing that I was going to go back in, but but probably my most proudest moment was the the second deployment when my dad was there to see me come back. So it's a big deal when when we come back to Fort Hood. Okay, the the process is there's family members that are at Fort Hood Field. You know, big huge Fort Hood emblem in the middle, and this and that helicopters and guys on horseback just standing there waiting. So when we show up at the airfield, buses pick us up. They got the whole battalion avenue blocked off from the cars. So the buses show up in front of the field and then the battalion makes a big formation on the opposite side of the buses from the crowd. So all the thing the crowd can see is these buses show up, you know, and then you see like maybe feet or something underneath the buses. Once the, the everybody's formed up, the buses roll away and then somebody's forward march and this big mass of 500 people march onto the field, onto the parade field. You know, and you got the guys with the horseback and the sabers, you know, like walking forward with them and everything. The crowd's going crazy and this and that, whatever, you know, but, but um, my first time back, there was nobody there. My third time back, there was nobody there, you know, except just buddies. But, but realistically, I, I was so proud that my dad was able to see that. That's probably, you could probably ask him, that's probably the most proudest moment in his life that, that you know, with me as, as far as walking up on that field. Because that was a really bad deployment. It was a really long deployment. And, and uh, I remember writing a lot of letters saying just, I love you, I love you. I don't know what's going to happen, but I love you, I love you. And, and he was there to see it, you know, the culmination of coming back. That was really great. Do you recall the day service ended? Where were you when the service ended? Absolutely, I recall the day. It was uh, right around, I think it was February 20th, 2010. And uh, I was hanging out with a buddy that was still in. He had like two or three weeks left before he, he was in, but we were going through all of our clearing procedures together. We we're going through the same briefings and turning in our equipment together and this and that. I think he still had a couple weeks left, but I was in uh, Colleen, Texas. And um, I remember telling him, uh, you know, well, this is it. So I guess bye, you know, I'll get a hold of you or whatever. And that was the last time I saw him, but, but, um, it was a very odd feeling. I left a Fort Hood. I had no time frame. There was nobody waiting on me. I didn't have to go straight home. And that was when I, I went to Oklahoma and saw somebody that I'd served with in my second deployment that he had got out after after that particular one. So it's been a few years since I saw him, but I got to go see him in, in Oklahoma on the way back to Illinois from Texas. 
So you did return back to your home of record once you left. I did, yeah, absolutely. Um, came back and, and spent a year of just kind of driving around. I, I, you know, I shacked up at, at my mom's house, you know, which, which was really neat for her to be able to, to allow me to do that. I was not in the right sound and in, in mind uh, to to really be on my own, to be honest with you. Uh, there was a lot of issues going on as far as um, just trying to pay attention to, to not being, not having to pay attention, yeah. uh, not having any structure really left me kind of clueless. So how were you received by your mother when you got back? She was like... Oh, open arms. I mean, she was really happy that, that I'd been through everything in order to maybe be able to make it back. Um, you know, she was glad to see me. She was eager for me to... Uh, to be able to just chase down whatever I wanted to do. And so I actually started going back to Parkland College. After after a year of being home, I started going back to Parkland and uh, I started studying with graphic design stuff. I did some, some fine art stuff, some painting, some, some drawing and, and um, did a little bit of photography. But once I got to the digital computer things, I remember sitting in typography class with these giant monitors. I mean, we're in a class of 10 or 12 people and each individual student has a 30 inch monitor. Yeah, so I'm just looking around and, and, and there were just hours hours and hours of night surveillance in Iraq to where we're, we're literally looking through night vision for, you know, maybe six hours. We're looking through laser range finding equipment for hours and hours, you know, and implementing uh, um, sleeping procedures as far as different breaks and different shifts because we're just out there so long. So I learned that that staring at a computer screen for so long is, is it really, it, it hurts, hurts my eyes, it hurts my head. I don't like doing it. So, um, the only other thing in graphic design was, you know, all of these web page design and everything with computers. So I, I said I couldn't do it. And, and so I kind of shifted to a general studies kind of degree to where I just wanted to study things that were interesting, chemical, you know, chemistry and, and archaeology and forensic studies and death analysis and, you know, just certain things that were interesting to me that weren't necessarily going to grant me a doctorate in this or that. But, but I knew that it was well-rounded. So... so you mentioned the struggle of adjusting to the technology portion of going back to some of those things. Was there any other struggles in readjusting to civilian life in general? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I wanted to, I wanted to go berserk on people verbally. You know, I, I uh, was very. Um, aggressive, but, but tempered, you know, I, I was, I was, uh, I really closed in. I didn't express a whole lot of anybody. I really didn't talk to anybody. If, if I didn't know you or, you know, you weren't associated with anything that was going on, I didn't want to meet anybody new. I, I didn't really want to care to take the time to listen to anybody talk about anything. Even during classes when they say, okay, you know, it'd be wise of you to partner up with some people and study before this next final or whatever. That was very hard to do. I, I, I really had no intention of talking to anybody about anything. Um, and I, and even though I was, uh, I was quick tempered to, to get aggravated at things. I never like showed it. I, I never acted out in any way, you know, other than home, other than home. I mean, there were times to where I would just freak out about something and just leave the breakfast table and get up and just peel off. And, you know, and so my stepdad, stepdad, mom, my mom didn't, they never pressed me about it. They weren't going to be like, well, maybe you should do this. You're acting out like this. It's really not. They just wouldn't say anything. They were probably walking on eggshells, not wanting to, set me off or trigger me in any way. Right. Did you find that you were able to get the help that you needed through the VA or other services when you were struggling with those things? Yeah, it, it took, I mean, it took a while um, to, I was working after, while I was going to school, I was working with a good friend of mine to where it was pretty much my best friend. And, and it was the type of relationship that we were working together every single day and then hanging out all night. You know, so it was convenient that he lived close to the to the Parkland College campus that I would go over there and do my homework and in, in between and everything. Um, but uh, but I worked on my GPA. I, I made sure to utilize and implement the things that I 
was able to extract from the military life and bring with me, uh, I wanted to be able to utilize that. So I was always punctual and on time at, at, at school and on studying for, for different things as far as tests and making sure that I was always checking my GPA to see how this assignment only got 85, how's that gonna drag my GPA down? I was, I was rigorously paying attention to that. Yeah. Did you graduate from Parkland? I did, I, I, and I only did two years. I, I got a general studies degree, so you know I, I was gonna go for an applied sciences degree in graphic design until I got to all this computer stuff. And once I, I got there, I had to figure out a way that I was gonna be able to utilize those college credits from fine art history and modern art history and graphic design history and you know, all these classes I'd already undertaken and passed, I'd had to at least wrap it up into something that was able to contribute to this. And so the funny thing, I failed college algebra. I did. I studied all the time. I, I utilized the, the office hours with the professor. You know, I, I utilized the um, library tutors and things like this. And, and, you know, I put everything into it. I just didn't, there was something about it. I just didn't get it when you started using these types of this and that, woo, woo, woo. And so I, I, I was, one class shy of graduating. And so a friend of mine said, well, why don't you write the, you know, the, the council, the math, math council board and this and that. So one thing I did learn in college was to utilize writing. So I took all of these writing classes more than I had to, to know that wherever I was gonna be in the world, I could at least communicate clearly right. one way or another. And that's very important. So I wrote the, the council, you know, and I said, look, I'm not going on to some other college and letting them know that you taught me and you passed me and you shouldn't have. I said, in my math world, you are king. You are the top of, of the, my math world. Yeah. So, but, but this is one. And they said, well, you know, due to your extreme set of circumstances of being overseas so many times, you know, we, we have no choice but want to pass you, be, you know, in our gratitude for that. And, this, and so I was very grateful that they did that or else I would have had to take a whole nother math class for a whole nother six months, you know, to pass with one class that I needed. <laughs> Did you continue on education after that? Or no, was it? no, no. Parkland was it. I mean, and that's the thing. Once I graduated Parkland, um, I really, uh, things were, were going into motion that uh, were changing very rapidly. A best friend of mine, his father just dropped dead out of nowhere. Um, my dad lived down here in Florida. So at, at that point, I said, look, you know, I got this, this, you know, general studies degree that's not going to make any difference to anywhere else, anywhere in the world. That's going to land me some job because I took six months of archaeology. You know, but but to get down here to at least be able to see him and spend time with him, I, that was important. Now at the same time, I was missing the adrenaline. I mean, I was missing the trigger time of, of putting that vest on and knowing that you know, hey, if anything happens, you got a rifle, we're going to be all right. You know, that that was very exciting, um, and to not have that at all. Uh, it was, there was an, uh, an absence there. So I knew that I wanted to do something with wildlife, uh, but there was nothing exciting in Illinois, you know, maybe a snapping turtle, <laughs> you know? So, so I, there was just all the more reason to come down here where, where things were venomous and dangerous and, you know, scary and. <laughs> we have dinosaurs walking. That's right. <laughs> and uh, before we transition, you, you did use your GI Bill to support that education. I did. Yeah, and you know, and the, and the neat thing about Illinois was Illinois has something called the Lincoln Grant as well. And so I was actually getting paid to go to school for free. So the GI Bill worked, you know, one of two ways. Well, if you're a half-time student, they only pay so much. But if you're a full-time student, they pay so much in addition to allowance for housing or this or that. So my tuition was already paid for just for being an, an Illinois resident from the Lincoln's Grant. So I was getting full GI benefits to go towards, you know, paying for things and, and paying my way as far as living at my parents' house, still being a 30 year old guy, you know, in college, being at your parents' house, you know, but, but realistically, if had I been out on my own, I, you know, I, I could have choke slammed the landlord or, or, you know, kicked in a dent in my neighbor's car because they were, you know, calling me a this or that, or who knows what, you know? So I was very, very fortunate to have family members be able to support me in a, in a time where I was definitely not mentally right to, to deal with the average common citizen. Yeah, I understand that. 
when uh, when you transitioned out, did you did you join any veteran organizations or any groups outside? You know, I, I was thinking about that when I was attending Parkland, and um, I heard that they had a veterans group that that met for like maybe thirty minutes between classes every Thursday. So uh, I composed a list of questions that I was going to ask, you know, inside and, you know, how people cope or deal with each other, this or that, as far as service wise. And unfortunately it, it was really only like maybe four or five people and they were all national guard and they've never been deployed or anything. So, you know, at, you know, after looking at my list of questions and realizing that I'm not going to get the help that I need here, I sought out, um, a VA hospital that was in Danville that was about 30 minutes away. And I started undergoing something called prolonged exposure. Um, and at the time, right in 2013, 2014, it was still um, pretty new. I mean, it was just on the cusp of just being something that is being utilized frequently. So, and what that entailed, and you figure, you know, just maybe an hour or two once a week, you know, how, what's that going to do? It's only once a week and it's not going to, what's going to stick. But um, it, it was the doctor asking me the most detailed questions about my memories over there and, and you know about the, the worst memories I can remember and what did it smell like and what we're seeing and this and that and then she would record it and then you know the, the days in between our sessions I would listen to it and then I would also have a homework assignment of going into some socially awkward situation you know go talk to 10 strangers you know next week or you know go get into an argument with somebody and, and learn to calm down before you blow up at them or something. So, so that was the therapy that worked. And if you think about it in this way, if you almost get in a car crash on the way home tonight, okay, I mean, you got to slam on the brakes, you got to slam on the e-brake just to keep from hitting something and it just whew, freaks you out. The next two or three people you talk to about it, you're going to start getting worked up and you're going to remember it and your heart's going heart's to pound and, you know, but if you tell 35 people that, ah, I almost got into an accident, no big deal. So that was the premise of that is just talking it out and talking it out and talking it out. And even now there's certain things that I can talk about that will get me jacked up to the moon or certain situations that, that will just be a trigger to where I feel like I'm better get a flak jacket on. Yeah. Fourth uh, of July is no fun at all. And uh, I, I, you know, my mind knows that they're, they're fireworks. It's no big deal. But of course I can't help but think of, you know, being in some bunker somewhere in Baghdad and, and I see erupting gunfire and it's like, well, it must be a soccer night, I guess, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's almost ironic when you're suffering from a PTSD related to explosions. And then on 4th of July, we're celebrating. Just boom, 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 boom. Now, at the war of 1812, I know, I know. It's, uh, now, at the yeah. same time, I, I, I do know of people that will put out signs like, oh, veteran lives here, please don't. I'm not trying to take anybody else's joy. That ain't no big deal. I can lay around for a couple of nights and, and put some, some big ear, some hearing protection on, and that's really no big deal. And, that, and that's not what it's about. Please don't celebrate, you know, our 4th our of July because I'm susceptible to gunfire. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Did uh, any anything else of your military service, uh, military service experience affect your life in any other way? Maybe positive or uh, an example. We're talking a lot about negative experiences. Well, well, well those negative experiences are, are a direct reflection of. of being grateful for things. Um, I mean, all of the bad things that I can remember are, are, are always reminding me of how great we have it here and, and how, and how wonderful it is to have a 10 different pairs of shoes, let alone have a pair of shoes or be able to go buy a new toothbrush and not have to worry about this one being all crappy after so long. I mean, we have it really, really, really good here. And, um, it, it's unfortunate that, that so many people squabble over so many minute things when there's so many bigger issues in the entire world did you do you think your service affected the way you can relate to other people absolutely um, I, I, and I had to learn not to hold that against folks. I remember when I would be home from, from Iraq for two weeks on leave. And I mean, it would be like that 36 hours of a helicopter ride and a plane ride. And guess what? Now you're on campus and people are saying, Oh my gosh, my day was so crappy. First, I forgot my cell phone at home and I had to go 20 minutes back to get it. And then it was dead. So I had to spend the time to charge. And guess what? You know, 36 hours ago, I was going through some stuff. 
just to be able to get home to, to listen to this. But but you have to know that people are oblivious and it's not their fault. You don't hold it against them. But it's my responsibility, I think, after being through everything and, and, and you know, communicating the way we have in the army as far as tough love and, and you know, you're not, you don't care about somebody unless you're talking smack about them, you know, that, that's, I, that cannot be implemented here, you know, with, with any regular person. So it's my responsibility to have to uh, not lower my standards, but, but maybe, um, take down my barriers a little bit uh, in order to be relatable to other people, not try to, to find the people that are relatable to me because, you know, not everybody's going to see it the same way. Right. Aside from like, t you know, not taking what we have here for granted and appreciating what we have in the United States, is there any other life lessons you might've learned during your service? Always do what you say you're going to do. Um, if you're going to do something, do it right. That way, you know, you can be proud of it and, uh, just, just treat people, treat people nice, man. We all bleed red. We all breathe air. I mean, it's, it's, it's all our home. I mean, really the world's not that big. It's really not, you know, every bit of it is all of our homes. We have to respect each other about that. Um, and, and there wasn't, and there were times where I would get into some really serious heated arguments with people and say, well, you're from here. So what the hell do you know? You know, while I was in the service, but, but it's just a different, it's just a different perspective and we got to be able to respect other people's perspectives. I mean, we don't know anything. We don't know anything about anybody else. Right. How has your military service impacted your feelings towards war and the military in general? Um, I think it's, I, I think it's necessary. I mean, anywhere you go in the world, security has to be your, your top priority. You know, you look at those folks on naked and afraid, if they're going to go out in the middle of Africa and they can catch a fish and have plenty of water, guess what? It's not going to do any good if someone's going to sneak in and kill you. Um, and, and we live in a, in a world now to where, uh, it's going to be easy for, for people to do that from within our borders, from without our borders. It's just that unfortunate. So having security through a U.S. government military is essential. It has to be essential. War sucks. It's ugly. It's nasty. Um, and it's never calculated and it's never predictable ever, ever, ever predictable. People train on a federal level for years to, in order to, to make mistakes because we're all human beings. Um, you know, robots run out of batteries, you know, but, but, uh, bullets, they, they don't care who's who, uh, it's, it's just something that if, if we can um, just try our best to minimize collateral damage at every turn and it, it's just never predictable is all it's, but security has to be, it, it has to be done. I mean, that's no other way around it. Right. Do you have any messages you'd like to leave for future generations who will hear this or see this video, this interview? Yeah. Um, you know, I fought in a war. Uh, that, that is going to be, you know, long, long forgotten about because there really wasn't a whole lot of change once everything was established. You know, people were voting for the first time after a dictator had been toppled. Uh, there were no weapons of mass destruction that we were supposed to go over there and, and seize. But um, a year after I got out of the military, my unit went back for a fourth time. Uh, a year after I got out, the place that I served last in Mosul was toppled by ISIS. I learned that, that one of the most beautiful mosques that I drove by, the Grand Mosque in Mosul, was used as an ID factory in 2017. That's terrible. Um, so people ask me, you know, well, if it, if it was fallen by the wayside, you know, well, what do you think you served for? I mean, was it for the security of the American people or was it for, you know, just the, the brothers in battle or this or that, you know, and, and I've been out long enough and I've crossed paths with, with enough people, interesting people that, that, I truly believe that what justifies my service through that Iraq war and through the long hours and, and years of in the military, what justifies that is people in America taking the courage to 
follow their dreams to be happy, to, to be brave enough to find what you want to chase after and go get it and, and not let anybody tell you anything otherwise. Um, there's too many people that live their whole life in fear to where they just, you know, work the same job that they don't necessarily like, or they don't pick up some hobby because they're afraid that people are going to dog on them about it, or they are afraid that they're not going to be good at something. So they don't try something new. So, so when I meet people who say I'm doing this and it's doing great and I, I tried it and I really loved it. And so we're traveling or we're doing this and I'm, you know, really happy that that's something that justifies my service personally is, is, is people just being courageous enough to, to go out and grab what you want to do to make you happy yeah. legally. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time to share your recollection of your military service. Thank Will you. you let everybody know what you do now? Yeah. So, so now, um, you know, I, I work in environmental management here in Southwest. I deal a lot with nuisance wildlife, but, uh, for the past year I've been taking soft pel pastel classes at a local art center here in Northport. Um, you know, it, it's been here for over 30 years. And so my wife and I did a date night and it was once a week. So we went and took a soft pastel class and uh, fast forward a year later and um, we are, are both selling paintings and we're winning awards and we're being asked to display our paintings in certain public places and uh, we're being invited to certain public events. And uh, I took particular paintings that I did from photos of Iraq and uh, I made a show, it's called Art of War and I also made a calendar. So the calendar itself is actually being utilized as a charitable way for people to donate to a campaign that I'm running to develop a program for veterans to gain art healing wherever they are. So the last year that I was too sketchy of, of going into the art center to talk to anybody, and now fast forward a year later, it's been very therapeutic for me to do these paintings and meet people that are interested in the same things. So, um, so this program is going to be developed basically to cater specifically to veterans specific needs. If they so choose to want to be able to obtain, uh, art therapy, and it's whether it's free classes or whether it's a particular courses that they want to take or if they need specific supplies that we would be able to offer um, if they're willing to be brave enough to try to use that as a coping skill you know for time in their service and things that they've seen or done then we're here to back them up for it and it's something that was very influential on me and I want to be able to provide that for somebody else I know people that they say you know that's been decades since NAM I haven't talked to it about it or anything um, but but I'm not trying to get people into in front of a crowd. I'm not necessarily trying to make master artists. I'm just trying to provide another tool for folks to have that's available to cope. Yeah, you know, and it was just recently that I learned something from a Vietnam veteran. So you hear a lot of people, they say, you know, well, thank you for your service and think, you know, there was even a lady that asked me, um, I've heard that, that that's not really what you say because it's too cliche and people don't really mean it. So can I say thank you for, I said, yes, you can say thank you for your service. That's fine. I met a, a, a soldier that was a Vietnam veteran and he said, you know, you tell Vietnam veterans is welcome home as opposed to think because of the fact that they didn't have a very good homecoming, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> what do you wish more people knew about veterans? About veterans. I, I mean, realistically, um, you know, we all want to talk about it. We do. We, we all want to be able to describe to somebody our greatest achievements in the, in the military or one of our proudest moments or a funny anecdote or some of the hardest things we've seen. But we don't want to be dubbed stuck in the war or stuck in the military, you know. And the fact of the matter is, you know, th that's a kind of a subconscious feeling that veterans might might have, you know, th that they would say, well, you know, I would love to, to answer your questions, you know, and, and people say, well, I don't want to like pry. I don't want to pry. I don't want to bring up something sensitive. Half the people might need that. Half the people might need that because after telling that story, maybe 10, 15 times of being pinned down or, or, you know, being the last one to, to rely on or seeing this or seeing that. I mean, after so many times of telling it, you know, maybe getting a good cry on would feel better as well. So that's another thing that I've learned since being out. I didn't cry at my grandpa's funeral four months after I, I, I moved down here 
in Illinois, he died. And, um, you know, we folded up the flag. I presented the flag to my grandma. I was actually in class A's and everything, even though I was, had been out of the military. And, um, and I didn't cry then. And, and but, um, I mean, I, I cried during Disney movies. I watch war movies, you know, it's not too much for me, but it's the real sentimental moments that I just really get a good cry out. And, uh, I'm, it just feels really good. Uh, you know, the, the, the biggest thing about veterans, especially combat veterans, they say, well, why are you so sketchy or weirded out by people? It's because when you go day after day after day of being exposed to these traumatic incidences, you have no time to emotionally process them. Yeah. So you're just socially and emotionally detached. Ah, screw it. They're not going to be relatable. Why should I talk to them? Because we bleed red because we are breathe air, you know, it's, it's okay. You don't have to be through war to, to have PTSD or, or be traumatized. You know, we're, we're all, we're all living the same kind of life. Just trying to get by. Yeah. Anything else that you want to share? Um, tip your waitresses. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, share your experience, share your story. And, um, I know it's not easy for a lot of us, like myself as a veteran, I know some of us can be very reserved when it comes to our experiences. Yeah. And I thank you for taking this time to speak with me and open up and, um, you know, we'll preserve this history and make sure that people know and future generations are aware of what occurred. And, you know, it's, it's great that you participated. Thank you. I hope it encourages others to do the same thing. Really, it feels good to get it out. Thank you so much.